Hello and welcome to the Comic Cave. I'm Ramsey, aka Captain Away, and today I'm looking at the 2011 to 2012 and 2013 to 2014 series, Ghostbusters. Okay, yes, I may be being a bit self-indulgent this year, but what the hell, it's 2020. But yes, the Ghostbusters have long been one of my biggest fandoms, along with Ninja Turtles, Batman, and Spider-Man. Those are pretty much my top four, along with maybe Legend of Zelda. But hey, we're not here to talk about me, let's talk about some Ghostbusters. As I've said in previous videos, IDW has specialized in licensed properties, but they have a very dedicated approach to it. While there were some various single issues and specials featuring the Ghostbusters before this, it wasn't until the team of writer Eric Burnham, artist Dan Schoening, and colorist Luis Antonio Delgado that the comics became an ongoing series. What makes their approach unique is that they assume that if you're picking up a Ghostbusters comic book, then you're probably already a big fan of the franchise. So instead of paying homage only to the movies, they also draw from both animated series, the various video games, and even the other IDW comics, treating most of it as actually being in continuity. But just in case you're not quite as big of a fan as, well, me, they actually do make plenty of allotments for that as well, so whether you're a hardcore ghost head or have barely watched the movies, feel free to strap on your proton packs to go for a ride, because it's time to take this away. The comic opens on introducing us to all four Ghostbusters, giving us their names, their faces, and hints into their personalities right off the bat. Then we pull back to see that they're on a talk show. Janine's talk show, in fact, having apparently graduated from being their long-suffering secretary to being... I don't know, Ellen or something. I have to be honest, this is literally page two and I'm already pretty much in love with the comic. Everything already feels so familiar and the art is just perfect. Shoning somehow managed to find a cross between the various cartoon depictions and the real life actors while still managing something a little different than either to give it that unique feel. In essence, the art is a perfect metaphor for the whole comic, a mashup of the various things you might expect to see with a bit of a twist to make it something new and different enough to be enjoyable on its own. But on top of that, we already get our first of what will be a great many references made to other Ghostbusters media in the form of Dib Devlin, game show host from the real Ghostbusters episode, The Devil to Pay, just standing there in the background. It's a reference you don't have to get to enjoy the scene and probably wouldn't even notice if you don't get it. The pages of this series will literally be littered with all kinds of references like this. From the appearance of characters from the Sanctum of Slime video game, to a hiding drool the dog-faced goblin, or even Shaun of the Banshee and Peter Venkman's father from the first animated series. All of which just look like random set dressing for anyone who wouldn't get the references. And the references don't stop at just other Ghostbuster media as we'll soon see. After Janine takes a question from an audience member who turns out to be Gozer the Gozerian, helping set the mood of the comic by bringing references to the first movie and a weird Stay Puft Marshmallow Man with Ray's face, we then get a cameo from Ray actor Dan Aykroyd's fellow blues brother, appropriately appearing as a ghost. R.I.P. John Belushi. Jake Blues here cryptically warns us of the third, before we learn that this is just a dream. The Ghostbusters investigate this weird premonition, leading to another first of many great Egon vids, where Egon recommends they take a look at Ray's brain and Ray suggests an MRI, to which Egon somewhat reluctantly agrees as though the idea hadn't even occurred to him. <laughs> Man, you're messed up, Egon. Seriously though, I think the Egon bits proved to be some of my favorite moments overall. Like later, after they've been visited by a strange man at the firehouse, Egon mentions that the man wasn't human, which he knows because he scanned him with the PKE meter. Because he scans everybody. Oh Egon, you sly boots. Anyway, without much to go on, the Ghostbusters get on to some regular haunts, which is where this comic really shines in my opinion. While you might think of Ghostbusters stories as being primarily end of the world cataclysmic stuff, this series would get pretty tiresome if they faced that for every single arc of the comics. Not that we don't still get plenty of it, like in this opening arc with this whole concept of the third. This third turns out to be Edolness, the third minion of Gozer. 
like Vince Clortho and Zool before him, who possessed the bodies of Louis Tully and Dana Barrett, respectively. Adonis possesses sleazy corporate suit Jim Silver, whose company owns the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man. His goal is to capture Ray, since Ray is the selector who chose the easily defeated form Gozer took to destroy the world in the first Ghostbusters film. I love how this plot actually builds on an idea from Ghostbusters the video game, but it doesn't at all require you to have played that game to follow along. Similarly, you may notice reading the comic that the Ghostbusters here work for the city of New York, something that happened during the Ghostbusters video game, with the Paranormal Contracts Oversight Commission, pronounced Peacock for short, headed by Walter Peck monitoring their business. This is explained for us in a mini-comic included at the end of Volume 1, so that, again, those who have only seen the first movie will not be lost. Those mini-comics will continue throughout the entire first series run, giving all kinds of useful background information and extra details, just to make sure no one feels too lost. You really have to appreciate the effort the creative team has gone through to allow even the most casual fans to keep up, while not boring the uber nerds. Edolnus fails in getting Ray to pick a new form for Gozer, causing the reappearance of the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man to have the first volume end mostly by just treading familiar ground. The entire second volume sees them face off against a haunted amusement park. The main ghost here attempts to possess Peter, and we have a throwback to Pete's Columbia University office we see in the first film as he defeats the ghost, I kid you not, simply by psychoanalyzing it. It's actually a pretty awesome moment, since in a lot of the expanded media, Peter often has little purpose beyond being a loudmouth jerk. Which, he obviously is, but it's nice to see moments where he can be more. In Volume 3, the small haunts continue as the Ghostbusters go on a good old-fashioned road trip across America in what I call the Ectovan, and they actually call the Mobile Containment Unit. This cross-country road trip sees them take on the ghosts of Battle Ready Armies in Detroit, spontaneously combusting musicians in Seattle, UFO-obsessed guards in Roswell, and even a voodoo priestess with a thriller-dancing army of zombies in New Orleans. No, really. They thriller dance. That's clearly zombie MJ there. These stories highlight some of the best and worst of the series, honestly. I like how they take the chance on these small haunts to focus in on certain Ghostbusters, like giving us some background on Winston where he uses his history as a Marine to talk the ghost of Major General Anthony Wayne into surrendering to the Ghost Trap while they're in Detroit. It's really notable because it highlights how the creative team focuses on these characters. It's easy to push too far and make them feel like caricatures. But instead, Burnham maintains balance and keeps them pretty down to earth, regular people working a job like it's just any 9 to 5. The juxtaposition we get between these serious horror movie hauntings and the seen it all attitudes of the protagonist is the perfect background for the humor to really come out, and I think it shows a level of understanding the property in a way that most people would probably simply overlook. But there is also a bit of a tendency for some of these stories to drag, as there are more than a few times it feels like they're straining a bit to fill up space. Which can happen to any ongoing comic, obviously, but it's especially noticeable in the issue about the spontaneously combusting musician in Seattle. We get the legend of this musician, Dante Barnes, on the first page, then again a couple pages later from a fire marshal, and then again a couple pages after that from Dante's old drummer. Why do we need to get this story so many times? I don't know. I guess just to fill up space. Their final stop on their ghost tour across America is to Chicago, where they meet up with the Rookie from the Ghostbusters video game, who still has no name, but does finally have a voice, and uses it to try to start some shit between Chicago and New York. Ooh, Chicago's obviously better though. What? Don't at me. But when the guys finally get back home to New York, they find they've been replaced by a new team calling themselves the Ghost Smashers, because they literally shoot ghosts until they explode. Yikes. This team is headed by Ron Alexander, who has actually been appearing since the very beginning of the series. Since the Ghostbusters work for the city now, he was able to get his hands on city documents showing how the proton packs work, and attempt to make his own, with somewhat limited success. It was all good enough for him though, and so he recruits a team of sexy ladies with attitude. Most likely for gross reasons. To become the newest, greatest paranormal exterminators in the Big Apple. Unfortunately, though I like these character designs, we get almost no screen time with any of them. They barely get names, let alone actual personalities. 
Just for the record though, in case you want to know, from left to right here we have Ginny Moran, Danny Spack, and Lou Kamaka. Also, unfortunately, the smashed ghosts just pull themselves back together after a while, and apparently enough have been blown apart that they all pull back together at once, filling up the city like a giant glow-in-the-dark ectoplasmic landslide of Gak. Haha, <laughs> Gak. Yeah. That may be the prettiest horror movie monster I've ever seen, though. The Ghost Smashers get shut down because of this, and Ron gets thrown in jail. But the Ghostbusters suddenly go missing, prompting yet another new team to try and fill the gap. And again, it's a lady team. This time, though, the team is formed by Janine Melnitz, their secretary, who teams up with Kylie Griffin and Melanie Ortiz. Kylie Griffin was one of the members of the Extreme Ghostbusters, and was a popular enough character from that series that they brought her back into continuity as a part-time worker in Ray's bookshop. I really like her first appearance look, but apparently Shoning decided she wasn't cartoony looking enough, and her appearance morphs into weirder and weirder territory as the series goes on. Ortiz was introduced as an FBI agent in the Roswell issue the Dana Scully to her partner, James Savage, who had brought them out to Roswell seeking aliens. Though those aliens had turned out to be the ghost of alien-obsessed guards from Area 51. Yeah, you heard me right. Ortiz's so-not-having-it attitude with Peter is also a great source of fun throughout this series. The new Ghostbusters are finding that ghostbusting is much harder than it looks, so to keep things running smoothly as they look for the real Ghostbusters, Walter Peck adds Ron Alexander to their team. Even though, ugh, I hate that guy. Ron is even more of a self-obsessed loudmouth jerk than Bankman is, who already walked a pretty narrow line between bad and too far. Supposedly he's here because he understands the mechanics of the technology, even though that supposed understanding is what created the situation that got him jailed in the first place, but, you know, white male privilege, I guess. At least we get some good moments out of this, like this, and this. You're so right, Janine. You're so right. Once the Ghostbusters return, the new Ghostbusters disband, for the most part. Ron goes off to help Rookie in Chicago, Janine goes back to her secretary position, and Ortiz returns to the FBI. Griffin does stay on as part-time Ghostbuster, though, and Ortiz soon returns as FBI liaison. The next two volumes are just more of those same great smaller haunts. These include the Ghostbusters facing off against ghost doppelgangers, the ghost of a frozen sailor who has frozen an entire ship in place in the ocean, and even the ghost of some of Janine's ancestors who have come back to judge her worthiness. Those guys aren't evil spirits though, as we learn from this exchange. Besides, that would be profiling. Oh Egon, you sly boots. Also, the way that Egon captures the Viking ghost is just too great. He does it using a specially installed wall trap that is activated by voice command. And the phrase they chose for the command is one they thought would be very unlikely to be spoken ever. And that phrase? I love the Red Sox. I don't even like baseball and that's admittedly a pretty good bit. They also face off against a number of holiday-themed ghosts, including a Halloween haunt with a sort of Ichabod Crane slash Headless Horseman throwback who's the spirit of jack-o'-lanterns, I guess, and a Krampus-type ghost on Christmas. My favorite, though, is on New Year's when they track down a ghost that can show them their greatest fears, which we get a brief glimpse at. Yeah, this one is for big Ghostbusters fans for sure. Egon's fear here is the boogeyman from the real Ghostbusters cartoon that was his biggest fear as a child in that episode. Ray's fear is himself as possessed by Vigo the Carpathian, as he was at the end of the second movie. And Bankman's fear is... a giant... cockroach? What? My only guess is that it's another callback to a real Ghostbusters episode, Drool the Dog-Faced Goblin, where Peter said he really disliked cockroaches. The final two volumes come together into one giant Ghostbusters epic. Titled Mass Hysteria after the famous quote from the first film, it celebrated the Ghostbusters 30th anniversary in style. The story focuses on signs of the end of the world, including blood raining from the sky, seas boiling, human sacrifice, dogs and cats living together. Oh, um, <clears throat> sorry. Maybe just the blood rain, really. But while the world seems at risk of ending, life goes on for all the characters we've met so far. We also get the introduction of my favorite Extreme Ghostbusters character, Eduardo, though Kylie is great too, obviously. 
We also see Winston getting married to his longtime love interest, Tia Clark, a character created for a Ghostbusters Valentine's Day special from before the ongoing series started. And she continued to develop a relationship with him throughout this series, until this point where they're finally getting married. And we learn that, wait, what? Winston's middle name is Ramsey? My name is Ramsey. I share a name with a Ghostbuster? Oh, I always knew I liked you, Winston. As the Ghostbusters continue to investigate what's going on, they end up calling in help from the Rookie and all the original Ghost Smashers, finally giving the ladies a chance to have some lines and do something. Ray even starts dating one of them, Ginny Moran, who apparently is designed after Dan Aykroyd's real-life wife. How sweet. We also get the first appearance in this series of Dana Barrett and Louis Tully, the pair that were possessed by minions of Gozer. Everything seems to be pointing back to another reemergence of Gozer, but it's worse than that, Jim. It seems that actually it's a sibling of Gozer's named Tiamat, who is taking interest in the world now. It seems Tiamat was drawn to Earth by the knowledge of Gozer's defeat and took an interest in the Ghostbusters. All of Tiamat's messing with our heroes, though, seems mainly to be just trolling Gozer. And the Goz even shows up for a giant monster sibling fight between Stay Puft and Dragon Tiamat. That marshmallow never stood a chance. The ending of the series is honestly a little disappointing. They get rid of Tiamat thanks to a sacrifice. Winston, ever the Marine, attempts to sacrifice himself, but Tiamat doesn't let him off the hook that easily. Instead, all she does is take away everyone's memories of his relationship with Tia. Which seems like it would be a big deal, except that only a few pages later, they hint that he will simply get the chance to start the relationship all over again. But while that may be a weak ending, Mass Hysteria overall serves as a great conclusion that definitely feels like it is what the entire series was building up to. Which means we've built our way up to the breakdown. Let me start with what I didn't like, which first and foremost was the panel layouts. Almost every single panel of every single page was drawn like it was meant to be the widescreen still from a movie. And with a license like this, I can see why you might want to do that, but man, does it get old. It leaves almost every single page having almost the exact same panel layout, with little to no variation. Even though I think the art works very well for a comic book, this series can get so boring to look at after a time. I mean, this is a comic about weird paranormal shit happening. It's perfect grounds for getting crazy experimental with the panel layouts, but it just doesn't happen. There's also the noticeable amount of what feels like filler writing, as I've mentioned, and that somewhat disappointing ending to the series. I also don't love it when the ghosts get a little too talkative. Ghosts in the movie were presented a bit more like after images, memories, or emotions. These ghosts carry on rational conversations, which is a bit weird. Especially Tiamat, who pretty much just acts like a regular person. Gozer was much more frightening as a Cthulhu. And yes, I, I know I'm pronouncing that incorrectly. As a Cthulhu-like cosmic entity. But I will give it this, the writing is strong enough that the talkative ghosts don't end up bothering me that much at all. And what I like about this series is literally everything else. It captures the feel of Ghostbusters so well, but beyond that, it just tells great stories, has great characters, and is honestly a really fun and funny read. I truly feel that if you're not already a Ghostbusters fan, this comic might just be able to change your mind. And that's probably the highest compliment I can give to a series like this. So yeah, obviously I'm giving this series a recommendation level of very high. If you're a Ghostbusters fan by any stretch of the imagination, this comic should be a fantastically fun and enjoyable comic for you to read. If you're not, well, then who the hell are you? How can you not like the Ghostbusters? Are you a ghost? I don't think we can be friends. The collected editions get nine proton packs. You better believe that's a good thing. I know it probably feels like cheating to rate all the volumes the same, but they do really all come out about the same level. Which is why I'm sure you can guess how that breaks down. Now there are only, unfortunately, four issues per volume. But you also get plenty of extra artwork, covers, and script-to-page breakdowns to make them all worthwhile. Plus, they collect a great comic. 
There are also two hardcover collections that collect pretty much all the same material, but with new introductions, some very pretty packaging, and with the greater convenience of owning two volumes instead of nine. So sure, two more proton packs for them. everybody for watching it's october now so every comic i'm covering for the rest of the month is gonna be in some way horror related i know you probably feel that ghostbusters is pretty stretching the idea of horror but eh i really wanted to do it anyway we got three more weekends on this theme so make sure you click that subscribe button to be here for those videos and i hope to see you then right here in the comic cave